remember a recruiter had randomly, you know, saw me and, you know, well, what are you doing with your life, <laughs> you know, type thing. And I was like, oh, honestly, not what I want, <laughs> you know. And I, I think that's where the idea kind of started. Um, and then, you know, over time I just said, well, you know what, I need to do something different. And so I decided to, to join the military. You know, I, I scored extremely high, and so the recruiters were like, well, just take a look at the book because every single job in here is available to you, you know, so you can pick anything. And they, they basically said, we don't want to force you into, you know, one that we think is good for you. Why don't you just look? And when I was looking through the book, all of a sudden I came across EOD, and I mean, it, it just seemed to, to resonate with me, you know. The first two words was protects people. And, you know, I'd spent my whole life, you know, acting as a protector, and that's the role I felt comfortable with. And then, you know, it just gets more awesome after that, you know, Secret Service disarms bombs, you know, handles dynamite, you know, gets to blow things up. And, and so I was like, this sounds like, you know, the, the right fit for me. And instantly all the recruiters tried to talk me out of it. They're like, oh, no, 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 no. You don't want that job. They're all crazy, you know, so. And they're like, nobody makes it through school. And the more they tried to talk it, you know, down, the more interested I was. And so uh, I came in um, with a guaranteed slot for EOD. You know, back in the early 90s, uh, life was very interesting <laughs> as an airman, you know. You know, it was very, very strict. You know, you didn't have free time. You didn't have a desk. You didn't have, you know, we didn't have computers back then. <laughs> And uh, you had to ask permission for almost everything. You worked insanely long hours. So um, us airmen, we kind of had a, a similar philosophy as uh, you know later on in life. You know when we were doing a lot of the army missions, everybody would say, you know, well, embrace the suck. <laughs> you know, and uh, um, what we would say back then was, you know, well, you're an airman, damn it. <laughs> you know. When I first got to Nellis, I actually brought my four younger brothers with me. I thought we were going to be able to, you know, stay together as a family. And the Air Force is like, no, you're in the dorms with a roommate and two sweet mates. So I had to, you know, let my brothers come back to Texas. And uh, that, that was very difficult for both me and them. Um, you know, on their side, they felt a sense of betrayal. On my side, I felt like I'd let them down. And it was something I, I didn't even expect. My first taste of combat wasn't what I'd call, you know, real combat. Uh, we were doing missions where we had to, you know, go in and handle different things. Some of them were, were black missions, some of them weren't. But, um, if you'll remember early in the war, uh, there was a lot of Tomahawk missiles being sent over and some of those didn't go where they were supposed to. <laughs> and so we would have to try to go in and you know, render them safe and make sure that the village who was supposed to be our ally was safe, but from their perspective, we just bombed them. <laughs> so, you know, there was, there was a, um, a lot of conflict there. And um, on one of those missions, one of my troops got uh, um, injured pretty bad, but we didn't, you know, we weren't sitting there directly engaging the enemy. So that was kind of my first, I guess it was kind of like, you know, toes in the water. <laughs> you know, I didn't just get thrown in in the middle of a, a minefield while everybody shooting at me. The, the sense there for a while was that um, a lot of the IEDs we were rendering safe were very easy for us. Um, and we had to constantly try to make sure that we didn't get complacent because you never know when, you know, tactics are going to change, when, you know, types of IEDs are going to change. Um, but when things did change, um, it got really bad really quick. My team member and I, I remember at one point, we just had, I'm not sure if you'd call it despair, but pretty much like every day you got up, you were like, this sucks, you know? Because you couldn't see a day where you weren't putting somebody in a body bag or responding to, you know, deaths and severe injuries. And it just started to kind of mentally eat at us there for a little while. Um, like I said, you know, training-wise and preparedness-wise, we weren't expecting that kind of skill. Uh, I mean, we'd, we'd seen, you know, unfortunately in EOD, you see a lot of, you know, dead people and you respond to a lot of tragic, horrible situations. 
but we weren't used to that scale where it was just repeated over and over, day after day after day. Um, and I remember for me that was that was a, a difficult time. It's it was such a weird moment because I thought I was dead. You know, you couldn't see anything, you couldn't hear anything. Uh, at a certain point, there was like this, you know, this that screaming whine sound, but and and I couldn't feel anything at the time. Um, matter of fact, I, I felt weightless. And you know, turns out our rear security said, you know, our vehicle was shot up significantly in the air. So, you know, for a moment we were weightless. Um, but that, that matter of time, you know, for me felt like forever, you know? I remember just sitting there like waiting, like, what's, oh, is there anything, what happens next, you know? <laughs> like it's just black and, and weightless and, um, you know, real time that was probably, you know, maybe two seconds. But for me, it felt like an eternity. I was just sitting there waiting, like, what's what happens? And the first thought that ran through my mind, you know, it wasn't, you know, like, you know, people say, you know, oh, you know, your life flashes before you eyes. No, that didn't happen for me. The first thought that ran through my mind was, well, that sucks. And it sucks because I know I could have done more with my life, you know? That's what ran through my mind, was regret that I had not done my best, you know, every single day. And, you know, when the vehicle impacted the ground, that's when I realized I was alive, but, you know, I still couldn't see or hear and stuff. But that moment, was huge for me because I didn't ever want to, you know, meet death again and have that feeling like, man, I wish I would have done more, you know? And so it kind of lit a fire <laughs> under me, you know? It was like, well, just leave it all on the table every single day. Just leave it out there. It doesn't matter. So, you know, yeah, being hurt wasn't fun, but all I cared about was getting back to where I could give what I wanted to give, you know, because I didn't realize how much saving people had become my purpose. And that's all I wanted to do. I didn't really care that I was hurt. It was like, I need to get back out and start saving people. And um, that became my drive. And that was my drive after every time I was hurt. Did it get harder? Yes. You know, because once you're hurt, you don't want to, you know, like, you know, you get burnt. You don't want to stick your hand and get burnt again. And that's essentially what you're doing in combat. You know, you're repeatedly sticking your hand in the fire and it's going to get burnt and you got to do it again. And it's not easy. Your body starts to, you know, fight against you on that one as well as your mind. And um, I said, it's not easy, but I just didn't ever want to meet that moment again and say, Wow, I wish I would have done more. I started dwelling on those worst moments, you know, and, and not, not necessarily, you know, somebody died or somebody got injured and stuff. What I started dwelling on was kind of the moral injury of it because it eats at you, you know? I mean, how do you be a great human being whenever you see such horrible, horrible, people and actions, you know, and you don't think it is, you know, you don't think, oh, you know, that's going to impact you. But at a certain point, it, I don't know how to say it. It's almost like it starts to rob your soul. You know, you're like, well, wow, that's, that's what humanity is. And it can get hard to turn around and look, oh, well, what, let's, let's look at what was great in that moment. What, what was positive for humanity? And it gets very easy just to start to dwell on what was horrible and what was negative and what what it feels like to understand a world that's that bad, you know? And, and I, I think that's what it happens sometimes. And for me, that's kind of what it was. I got back after um, my last time and I mean, I knew instantly I was different, you know? So I, was, I talked different, I had different responses, I had you know, different memories. Like I didn't even remember so much of my childhood, you know? I didn't know where I was born, you know, like 
there was just giant pieces of me missing. And all I could see sometimes were the negatives. And I, I didn't bring it out, you know. I, you know, you see a commercial and, you know, dad's playing catch with his son. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm remembering, you know, a car bomb and, you know, one kid screaming, you know. And, like, why is that memory attached to that? It shouldn't be. But something just happens over time. And, and that's the, the problem is um, when people talk about uh, post-traumatic stress, a lot of times they think, you know, oh, it's just one moment. I could have gotten over it. But that one moment can be tied to another moment, which is tied to another, tied to another, tied to another. And eventually it gets so mixed up that for a lot of us, what happens is any feeling at all gets tied to a bad memory. So whether it's positive, negative, doesn't matter. Like you start to feel an emotion and it gets a, it's like it just chains to this horrible event that you can't get out of your head. And you cannot get out of that on your own, you know. Um, and that's difficult to accept, especially whenever you've gotten out of that moment for years, you know. You know, for years you might have been like, ah, oh, I got past it, I got past it, I got past it. But you weren't really getting past it. You were just pushing it aside and you were pushing it away. But at some point, it does need to be dealt with because it starts impacting your life. I mean, I was angry all the time. I was starting to say hurtful things and be mean and I was just aggressive to every response. You know, every response to me was a threat. And I didn't want that, you know. I like you don't want your your to treat your family like they're a threat. But I couldn't help it. Just any emotion was getting tied to other things I had gone through, and my response was everything's a threat. Everything's a threat, and you know I don't want anything around me. Like just stop. <laughs> you know, like you just want all input to stop. You know, and. You know, eventually I had to go get help. I was injured six times. Um, mixture of, you know, IED strikes, RPG strikes, uh, things along those lines. So I've had um, multiple fractures to my, my lower spine, um, two to my middle spine, and three to my um, cervical spine. So that has presented a lot of pain. <laughs> Um, and, and, and a lot of mobility problems, um, and it's, it's tough, you know, it, it hurts a lot. There's a lot of days where, you know, it hurts so much you just, it takes everything you have to get out of bed. But what I've realized is, no matter what your injuries are, they do not affect your potential. You know, it's so easy to go down the road of, oh, I can't do this anymore, I can't do this, and keep just pursuing what you were used to pursuing and getting frustrated because you can't do it. But what you have to realize is you still have unlimited potential. It's just something you've never done before. You know, start trying new things. You'll find something that, you know, whatever your injuries and limitations are, do not affect that. The leader is the person who's willing to just step up and do, you know. You might be making the wrong decision, but if you step up and you move, people will follow you. So you just have to be able to do that. Does it suck emotionally because people can die and get injured from your decisions? Yes. I mean, it's a way I don't know if I'll ever stop caring, you know, wondering whether I made the right decision here or there. But what I realized in combat is Sometimes there is no right decision. You just gotta make the best one that you can. And I didn't get up in the morning and go, you know, hey, let's do service before self. It was, hey, I don't want to meet death with any regrets, and I wanna do right by the people that didn't make it. You know, because as a survivor, that is what you have to do. You have to carry their legacy into the world.